know you have a hot topic when Wired Magazine decides to do a major piece on the topic at hand. Now, the topic at hand in Wired was actually a piece entitled Easy DNA Editing Will Remake the World, Buckle Up. They're talking about a gene editing technique that is so inexpensive and easy to use that in just four years it has become a ubiquitous lab tool. Here at uh, ASH 2016, we are talking about, uh, and what they were talking about is CRISPR, but we're going beyond that to uh, gene editing, not just CRISPR. And to do this, I'm with uh, Dr. Uh, Mitch Weiss, who is closest to me here, who is an MD and a PhD and chair of hematology at uh, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and Dr. Keith Young, who is an MD and a PhD, and a professor of pathology, Harvard Medical School, and a uh, pathologist at Massachusetts General Hospital. Okay, for the two of you, this is, like I said, a topic that is obviously quite hot. Before we go to talking about what's beyond CRISPR, I probably should ask you about Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeat System. Talk a little bit about CRISPR, would you please? I think that would be for you. Sure, I'm happy to start. So uh, CRISPR-Cas is a system that allows us to be able to go into living cells and organisms and in a targeted fashion be able to make change, specific changes to the DNA of that cell. Um, so this is very, very useful for being able to both knock out a gene, for example, change its function, uh, and also potentially to be able to correct disease-associated mutations, so turning the sequence back to what it should be and hopefully for the therapeutic benefit of the patient. Now, four years ago when you first saw this and started working with it, was there kind of an aha moment of, oh, this could be fun? I'll tell you about my aha moment. Everybody who works in the laboratory who studies biology, you, well, most people study genes. Right. And everybody has their favorite gene, and the best way to study that gene is to knock it out, right? To remove it either from cells or animals. And um, 10 years ago, that was a very long, laborious process. And with this new technology, it becomes very simple. And um, I, I heard about it for maybe six months or a year, and then, but I didn't pay too much attention. And then my postdocs and students would come to me with data saying, I knocked this gene out. And, um, and what, what, was the most, what was most amazing to me is how easy and fast it was. And so it was very obvious when I started seeing this um, um, coming from the people in my lab that they figured out on their own that this was, it, it, you didn't have to be very um, a, a psychic to see that this will change biology. Well, the, the thing that you don't see a lot of with new technology is the term I used, inexpensive. How did that happen? I mean, how is something like this so inexpensive? Some of it comes from the fact that previous technologies to be able to do this process. So gene editing is actually a field that's much older than just CRISPR. It goes back right. almost 20 years. And so there were other platforms that allowed you to do similar things to what we can do with CRISPR, but uh, they were much more expensive and required more specialized expertise. And really what CRISPR does is make the process of being able to make these targeted changes much simpler. And because the process is simpler, therefore it's much less expensive to do. Well, beyond lab studies, it seems to have a potential therapeutic f future. Is that correct? Yes. Um, as I said, you can, you can remove a gene. You can also correct a gene defect. And many diseases are genetic diseases that are caused by gene defects. So you can take it out, fix it, and put it back. Well, if you have a, if you have a defective gene, you can fix it. If you have a, and you would do that in a patient. If you have a gene that, that is working well and you want to know what it does, that, and you have a mouse or a cell line, then, then you can take it out. In most cases, you wouldn't take a gene out of a patient. However, if there was a situation where, where it might help a patient to take the gene out, you could first determine what the effects are in a mouse as a preclinical test. So it gives you, you, you probably the best representation when you look at pictures to symbolize this is a piece of DNA with a very fine set of tweezers and a scalpel yes. where you can make very precision changes. And so this goes hand in hand with precision medicine. DNA sequencing is allowing us to identify changes in our, in our DNA that contribute to diseases or prevent diseases. And that allows us to see what those changes are. Genome editing allows us to test if candidate changes really are what we think they are, and if so, further down the road to implement those changes in people. 
Now, it's been about a year and a half since the Wired piece was written. A lot can happen in a fast-moving field like this. So what's new, and specifically, what's beyond CRISPR? <laughs> um, so, yes, it's a very fast-moving field. Um, the innovations really are coming at a, just a breakneck speed. Um, I think in terms of what's new, there's a lot of things that are new. In this session, what we tried to do was highlight uh, some of the technology developments that we thought were interesting among the abstracts. So, what we saw in the abstracts don't obviously represent the full spectrum of all the innovation going on in the field, um, but we did highlight a few of the things that we thought were interesting with respect to the ability to alter more than one gene at a time, so what we call multiplex uh, gene editing, uh, and also the ability to uh, do screens, that, so to examine the function potentially of every single gene in the genome and ask which of those genes are actually critical for a particular cell's phenotype or, or, or um, function, uh, specific cellular function. And so we highlighted some of those. And then we also highlighted an abstract in which you're taking CRISPR and turning it from a gene editing tool, so something where you edit gene sequence, and instead turn it into something that can actually modify the expression of that gene. And so that's, that's an emerging area that many people have been working on and that uh, advances continue to come. And so we highlighted one of the abstracts that was a specific example of doing that, where you modify gene expression instead of gene sequence. I mean, it has to be kind of fun going to meetings and seeing what other people are doing with this, correct? It's really fun. Sometimes anxiety provoking because <laughs> there's, there's so many brains working on this and you, and it's, you feel like it's almost impossible to keep up. But if you can, if you can keep that ego part suppressed, then it is a real adventure. What are you specifically working on right now that we should know about? Um, so, in, in particular, my lab has been focused on issues of specificity of these nucleases. So, we know that we can get them to make a change at a specific target of interest, but what's less well understood is where else it might be causing changes in the genome. And so, methods both to define where those changes are occurring and then also improvements to the platform to further reduce those so-called off-target effects or side effects has been a, a major emphasis of my lab. The other piece is that we're also interested in some of these, um, we're interested in using the technology to be able to affect gene expression and hopefully to be able to do that in a more stable and heritable fashion. So we have a number of projects going in that regard as well. We are t doing two things. First, we, we study many genes in our lab and we're just using the CRISPR technology as a tool um, to study what happens to cells when you remove the gene or when you change it in some way. So we're using it as a tool for basic biology. Um, thinking toward clinical applications, we're using it to try to find a good way to treat sickle cell disease. I mean, in terms of being in a lab, it's, it's a lot of hard work and it can be, you can sweat and cry for years before you do something. This has to be fun. Oh, it's tremendous fun, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's a tremendously exciting field to be in. As Mitch says, it, it moves very quickly and some level, I think, provokes anxiety in people because you have to constantly be on top of the literature, but also on top of going to the meetings and hearing about all the latest advances. But I think it's a, it's a unique opportunity and a privilege, really, to be able to work in a field where the advances are coming so quickly and where the impacts are potentially so broad. Um, and so I feel very fortunate to have the ability to be able to work in this space and to be, sort of be where we are within that community. I think it's important to point out that this, this technology, which has tremendous applications in industry and in, and in healthcare-related fields, came from basic science. And um, th this technology came from back studying bacteria and from studying the structure of proteins and from studying plants. And I think the people who discovered it had no idea of how it was going to turn out. And, and this, has to, this is one of the um, prime examples of that making the case that it is important to support basic science because if you don't oh, support man. basic science as a country, um, then you will, you will lose the pipeline for amazing discoveries like this that will help us in the medical fields. I mean, there have to be companies out there, pharmaceutical companies, who are just trying to figure out how to work with this and to come up with new and exciting things. This, I think, will be probably exciting for the next several years. Yes, but if it weren't for the guys Those in guys, the basement yeah, exactly. of the stuffy old buildings. Who are always anonymous and no, never get their That's names. right, exactly. that, or the, uh, and the women, too, yes. actually. Actually, in this case, it's, it's, it's um, predominantly women for the CRISPR field, uh, not just guys. But, but they were not looking for, um, 
they were not looking for industrial applications when they discovered this. It's a great story, and thank you very much. We have a lot of great stories coming from ASH 2016 here in San Diego. Please check online where we are right now, as well as in print, in print uh, for ASH Clinical News. I am Rick McGuire.